Um, hello everyone, it's wonderful to see you. As I say, it's so nice to see loads of familiar faces. It's like uh, being home instead of being in places where I don't know anybody, so it's lovely. Um, so, overwhelm. Isn't it interesting that some people have already messaged Helen and said they're too overwhelmed to get to an overwhelm session? I guess there's, there's um, red flag number one, isn't it? Definitely. Um, but totally understandable. We've all been there. Um, so I just before I go to, to slides, um, I was going to see what you all think about what does what does overwhelm actually mean to you? What does it mean? What does it look like? You know, feel free to unmute and tell me. Or if you're feeling shy, you can put it in the chat box. But we're all friends here. So <laughs> I think it's where you don't know where to start. That's why I know when I'm overwhelmed, when I'm just like, I just don't know what to do first or next. Yeah, yeah, I get that. What do other people think? Yeah, I think I'm the same. You, you just don't know um, what has priority. Almost, you just you just don't know where to start. Yeah, there's just so much that you can't you can't uh, you can't get through it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you feel sick. Yeah. Yeah. Who was that? Was that Melanie or Parminder? Yeah. I Sorry, I didn't mean to talk at the same time. I said, it makes you feel sick. Yeah. Yeah, it does. That feeling in your gut. I think mm. it's a, a case of, as they've just, as the others have just said, mm. Helen's just said, can't see the wood for the trees. Um, and it, you sort of have to step back. Uh, and if you don't do that, you continue in that vein, unfortunately. Well, I do anyway. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like you say, you have to step back, but in that moment, you can't. And I think somebody yeah, yeah, used the right. word can't, you know, because it's all well and good knowing what we should do, but if we're stuck. Yeah. Anybody else? How what does overwhelm look like for you? What does it what does it do for you? Can't sleep. <laughs> yeah. Um, panic. Panic. I don't know whether anybody's already said that, but I was like, I arrived a little bit late, but um, it always comes with a certain level of panic for me. Mm. Yeah. 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 And for me, I think it's sort of going on from that panic. It's um, I then get very stressed. I find myself getting um, reacting with it to my kids. Uh, you know, I'll fly off the handle. It, it starts if I'm feeling overwhelmed in my work, it then just spreads um, to all aspects really yeah. really quickly and I know I'm being irrational but I can't seem to stop it ah interesting Elizabeth yeah and, I, and that's absolutely right isn't it it's not just work when we're in overwhelm it's not just oh I'm overwhelmed at work it bleeds into everything because you don't just leave it behind if we could just leave overwhelm behind at the desk that would be something but we don't yeah and it yeah. works the other way if I'm like I'm really finding at the moment as all the kids activities restart and all of a sudden like after school um yeah we're just doing so much my kids are well you know I think in that year that we've been in lockdown they've grown up a bit so they're suddenly doing so much more and they want to do everything because now they can and then I find that if I'm overwhelmed in the sort of the family sphere then that goes into work as well and then I, and I'm like right I've got I've got four hours now to work I must work and then I sit there almost like frozen because I can't because <laughs> I'm so overwhelmed yeah yeah, yeah. I, I understand that feeling absolutely um I, I, because you, you you get so much pressure to do things instantly nowadays that you sort of don't know where to start um the reason I'm late on this call is because we tried to put the client off but it was absolutely urgent he spoke to me and then he went on um and that's just stacked up another job to be done when we finished, in addition to the job I was going to do anyway. Um, and that does, to me nowadays, there seems, I'm, I'm old enough to remember what it was like when the fastest means of communication was the first class post. Sorry. Um, and, um, let me turn that off. And um, now you, you, you get it every way, don't you? You get it on your phone, you get it on the internet, if people can't get you on the phone, they'll send you a text. If you don't respond to the text, they'll find you on WhatsApp. They'll contact you on WhatsApp. And on it goes on. And there's absolutely no escape at all. Um, I can remember when I had a secretary and I had a receptionist. And to get to me, they had to get past the receptionist and get to the secretary. And now it's just 
whack any time of the day. So yeah, I think we're all struggling and I don't think it's just the lawyers, is it? I think other professionals are exactly the same. Yes, no, I think you're right, Paul. Well, first, just want to say really lovely to have you here and I'm glad you managed to get rid of your client to come and join <laughs> us. I'm really, That's <laughs> really glad you're here. But yeah, so much of what you say. And, um, do you know, it's interesting because I've, I've done this session for a few different firms over the last few months. It's been really popular. <laughs> Wonder why this year. Um, but, do you know, I didn't expect as much interest from all of us here at Gunner Cook because we're all self-employed lawyers. We get to choose <laughs> how much we work and aren't we all living the dream, etc. But, um, you know, what I'm hearing from you all is that that's, you know, that's not the case which I do know actually, because I've been there as well. But um, yeah, it's interesting. So the other thing I wanted to ask you, and we're all friends here, so hopefully everyone will be, will be happy sharing. As I say, you can, you can pop it in the chat box. If I asked you, if you think back over the last month, how much time have you felt overwhelmed? And do this in a percentage. You know, have you spent, have you been 100% overwhelmed the whole time of the last month? Has it been about 50%? Has it been 10%? You know, what, what do you think when you look back over your last month, how much time have you spent feeling overwhelmed? Just as a gut instinct. Professionally, 100% of the time. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, but I do, you know, I am capable of walking away and leaving my phone behind, which I think is something we've all got to do, haven't we? Uh, but yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, between normal working hours, then it just seems to be complete overwhelm at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And do you find, though, Paul, if you're saying you're saying within working hours, so are you saying that when those working hours are over and you've stepped away from your desk, are you absolutely fine then? Are you able to shut off that? I'm overwhelmed yeah. with the desk, but now I'm OK. Yeah, I've, I've actually moved back to the kitchen, but I did create a, an office in the in the loft. Um, but I've got fed up. <laughs> it's like a prison. But um, the, the advantage in having a separate uh, room is that, you know, once upon a time I would, go to work and I'd, my working day would be dictated by train times and I had to leave the office and get on a train or sleep on the floor and actually that's not a bad thing is it yeah yeah no that is good so we've had a hundred percent we've had a 70 percent where where are other people at over the last month okay It's not been so bad for me over the last month, but I must say the first part of the year, so sort of January to March with having the children at home and work, I would agree with Paul, it was definitely 100%, but I don't have the same ability as Paul, I don't think, to switch off. And so that very much then sort of went into evenings and weekends where it just felt constant. So I think sort of that period, which I know was hard for lots of people in, in for different ways and having children at home, um, it was definitely 100% for me. But for the last month, hasn't been hasn't been so bad. Right. No, that's, that's good to hear, Helen. So, yeah, we've had we've had a couple of 50 percent as well. So um, for, for the purposes of today's session, you know, if you're in huge amounts of overwhelm, then I hope this is going to be immediately useful for you. If you're doing OK right now, then it's a, it's tools for the future. You know, it's something to have there for, for the next time these feelings sort of creep up again. Um, an interesting point. That's why I did ask Paul about it. And Helen's alluded to it. Um, we've got men and women on here today, which is fantastic. Um, and I don't want to make a huge generalisation, but generally speaking, men are slightly better than women at compartmentalizing that's not to say all men are great at it you know some aren't but generally speaking men are better at leaving it in its box there that's the work that's the desk um, and, and stepping away but it's something us women do need to sort of learn from um, you know in, in the old days when we went out to work which you know for many of us even pandemic aside we've been working from home for years but you know it's, 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 it's use the example of my husband he would come home from work and he'd go and get changed and he changes shoes and he puts his keys in the place in the cupboard and you know men tend to have these things that they do when they get home from work or when they finish work whereas women tend to you know in in 
contrast to what he was doing, I would run in carrying the shopping, children behind me, turning the oven on, shoving the shopping down, you know, and I haven't even taken my coat off. I haven't taken my shoes off. I'm literally just running into starting to cook dinner, starting to look after the kids and haven't put my bag and my laptop down yet or, or anything. So just generally speaking, but if, if you're a man who also does that too, then, you know, there's a there's a lesson for you too. It is about creating this separation. We've all got to get a bit better. That That's not on the slides. That I wasn't necessarily going to mention that today. But you know what? It's all overwhelm. It's all stress. Um, so, yeah, if if we do need to get better at creating, especially those of us who are self-employed and work from home, pandemic aside, we work from home a lot. Um, and it is really important that we do create that mental and physical separation from our work and home life so you know whatever little rituals um you can create to say right i've finished work now even if it's just shutting the laptop down putting the papers to one side maybe it's just you know making a different flavor cup of tea whatever it is um having that that gap we all need it men and women it's just that men tend to be a little bit better at doing it seems to be something that you know maybe comes more naturally to them um than it does to us sometimes i do appreciate that's a huge overgeneralization um and i think i, just, uh, I was um, just going to say um hannah I've, I've just put that comment in and that's not a dig at men i promise it's just that just whilst you're you're saying that i find that i'm both Myself and my husband are working from home. We don't have children. So hats off to everybody who's doing homeschooling and the rest of it with kids. But I do find that my husband's very one at a time, whether it's work or um, anything to do with the home. Whereas I'm going around the house, I'll pick that up and I'll just do that and I'll just quickly do that. And I'll finish that because that's an easy win. And so when I put my comment about multitasking, I'm thinking about 10 things, whereas he's thinking, I've just got to empty the dishwasher. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, once he's emptied the dishwasher, I've got to uh, clean or uh, cook or whatever. I mean, yeah, I, I'm very lucky. We, we have a very good team, but it, I, he is very one at a time, whereas I am 10 things going at the same same time and I I wonder whether that's a bit of a disadvantage for women generally than men yeah. I'd rather be one at a time because then I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't get so overwhelmed <laughs> Yeah, th thank you. I can for see other women nodding their heads. Yeah, you know, thank you for the point. And actually, it, it's fascinating. It really is. I mean, we could do a whole session just on that. Um, but <laughs> I just saw an article yesterday on LinkedIn about multitasking. So I've been saying this for, for quite a while. We've always thought multitasking is a great thing. Turns out it's not a great thing um, for stress levels. And it's also not possible. We can our brains cannot actually multitask. So what we're really doing when we think we're multitasking is we're switching quickly from one thing to the next to the next to the next which is not good for us stress levels or focus and concentration so I'm afraid it is one where our male counterparts who are better at not multitasking it, that is something we ought to really be striving for because it's not good for us but interestingly this article I saw said do you know the phrase multitasking was created by IBM in the 60s 70s and it relates to computer functions so that's what multitasking was created for, not us people. So it's it's craziness. So thank you for bringing that up, Parminda. It's, um, yeah, we all need to stop trying to multitask. And if any of you have ever done my time and energy um, session, we talk about that a lot because actually when we're switching from one thing to another all the time we're just losing time because it takes a long time for our brains to switch from one activity to another so we lose time every time we try and switch so from an efficiency and effective perspective it's much better to just get one thing done and then move on to the next but it is it is you know there are differences between men and women's brains there's many books about it there's much science and it goes back to cave people you know the men were out they had to hunt that was their sole tunnel focus women were having to look after everybody. So women tend, again, huge generalizations, please forgive me, but generally speaking, women have more of a, um, oh, what do you call it? Diffuse awareness. We hold more 
because that's what we had to do to survive when we were cave people. Whereas men to survive had to have tunnel focus. Where's the threat? Where's the wild animal? You know, tunnel focus. Whereas we had to have diffuse awareness. So that's why we tend to operate like that, but it's not always good for us. So yeah, we can we can learn something from our male counterparts. Just, just one comment on that. Uh, I, I don't want to take up your time. I appreciate that. But given that my husband does everything one at a time, when we go shopping, food shopping in the supermarket, uh, he always says, go to the lady cashier. She'll go much quicker than a chap next to her because <laughs> she thinks about that diffusion thing. <laughs> a man will be just doing this. And actually, it does work. <laughs> Again, another generalisation. Please forgive me, but I have tested that theory and it does work. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. There, there are, look, there's another whole presentation on the masculine energy versus the female energy. But yeah, there, there's lots of reasons why um, you can use the positives for what you need them for. And then if you note the negatives, you can just try and take steps to change them around. I think that's that's the big lesson. But yeah, let me just share some some slides with you, some thoughts about overwhelm, and then we'll come back and have have another chat and I can answer any questions or you can share any experiences that, that resonate with you as I go through. Um, so it, um, want to put any comments or questions in the chat box as we go along. I'll come to them when I turn the slides off because I'm, again, not going to try and multitask and do the slides and answer questions at the same time. Um, just share my slides here. Here we go. Right, Helen, I can see you. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides? Yay, wonderful. Right, overcoming overwhelm. Here we go. We've started talking about some of these things already, so I'll um, skip through some of them. So this is a quote I really liked. Overwhelm is about feeling. I have something to do and I don't know where to start. So the point I wanted to make that we've already started to talk about today is it's not the same thing as stress. Now, clearly it's related to stress because, you know, you, if you're going to be in overwhelm, then you've probably got pretty high stress levels as well. But um, we can be in a stress situation without being in overwhelm because overwhelm is those things that we've already talked about it's feeling absolutely stuck almost glued to the to the place we don't know where to go next you know that's the characteristic if you like of overwhelm so it is a different beast if you like to stress but of course they are related um, so we get to the point where it's not just that we've got a lot to do so we might have a lot on our plate and we might feel our stress levels rising but we might not be overwhelmed because even though we've got a lot on our plate we might still be able to keep going for from one thing to the next to the next without getting stuck whereas overwhelm is this um, point of just feeling stuck literally overwhelmed you know it's like I said I was uh, sort of picture it as a sense of pressure there's just too much coming in on top of us and it is an emotional response you know that's what overwhelm is it feels as though it's all too much it is this pressure um, and we feel as though we don't have the emotional resilience to get through it all it is that real sense of feeling stuck um, so We've touched on quite a few of these points already, um, but I just, whenever I'm talking about a topic, I like us all to just sort of have a look at what the definition is. So we're all talking about the same thing. So overwhelm is an emotional state in which we may be struggling to cope or deal with the situation in front of us. And common feelings would be feeling inundated, swamped, overloaded, overpowered, defeated. So again, it's this real sense of, of a pressure on top of us. Um, and interestingly, the feelings are usually to do with volume. Um, you know, there's just too much going on, too much to cope with. There aren't enough hours in the day. So it tends to be a volume issue as well, whereas stress isn't necessarily, you know, we can be in, in stress and chronic stress, and it might not necessarily be to do with volume. So again, that's where overwhelm is slightly different to stress. So what can overwhelm look like? And we've all started to talk about this. So losing your sense of perspective. And, and this is a really, I think for us lawyers and the sort of work we do, this is really important because if we lose sense of perspective, we lose the ability to prioritize. And, and someone has definitely mentioned that this morning, you know, more than anything, almost, we need to prioritize because, um, you know, none of us are, are in house. We all work for multiple clients. Clients. So if we can't prioritise, how on earth are we ever going to decide what to do? Because we've all got clients who want the work yesterday. You know, that is part of the course of the work most of us do. So if we can't get perspective, if we can't prioritise, then no wonder we're going to feel stuck and we're not going to know where to start. 
So obviously feeling tired is going to be a side effect because our, you know, our brain is struggling to cope with the situation that we're in. Again, this has been uh, mentioned. We feel that we might overreact to situations. We may be more emotional than usual. We may feel cold and distant and highly strong and just not react to people in the way that we want to. You know, it might be irritable, short tempered. You find that things that you'd normally be able to cope with can't. Um, and you can't say no to things. Oh, can everybody just meet themselves if that's all right? Oh, can I do it? Um, just make sure you're mute for now if that's all right. Um, so yeah, you struggle to say no to things because it's difficult to evaluate what's important and what's not. And I have to say, I do see this problem with self-employed lawyers a lot. I mean, it's a problem for lawyers generally, um, but when you're employed, it, sometimes you lose lose perspective. But if you get the perspective back, you know, you're paid anyway, regardless of what happens. And it's up to the firm to deal with the client and saying, actually, client, we can't do that today. It's going to have to be tomorrow. But when we're self-employed, um, that's even harder for us to do. So when we are struggling to get perspective, when we are struggling to prioritise what we should say yes and no to, then we don't know how to say no. You know, it's a bit like Paul was saying with the client who was on the phone to him earlier, you know, when we're overwhelmed, we struggle to say, do you know what client, that's just not possible today. You know, I, it, it will be tomorrow or whatever it is that we need to say. But when we're overwhelmed, we just struggle. We, we, we're using all our energy to just keep going. And we don't have the energy to try and prioritize things in our mind and then be able to say yes or no to things because everything feels urgent. Everything feels it must be done now. And as everybody has mentioned already, it's that feeling stuck and not knowing where to start. Interestingly, we have this belief that everything will get better. You know, everything will be better tomorrow. It'll be better next week. It'll be better when the kids were back at school. It'll be better in June when we come out of strict lockdown. It'll be better next year when 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 you know that that's this um trap that we can fall into and what um one of my first coaches um said and, and i think is is really valuable and is something i live by now if things have been the same way for three months that's your new normal so if you in whatever situation you're in if you've been saying to yourself um, this will pass, this will change, that will change. But if you look back and you're honest with yourself and that situation has been like that for three months or more, then that is your new normal. So that's, you know, that's where you need to plan from. That's the situation that you're in. So that's quite a useful gauge to use. Um, sometimes there can be this growing sense of background fear, this sense of, um, well, what if, if I don't do this thing, what will happen? If I don't do this thing, there'll be some disaster, et cetera. Um, you know, that, that's a sort of symptom of overwhelm as well. This catastrophic thoughts, fearful that everything has got, you know, we sort of over dramatize everything. We've got this fear that everything's going to have dramatic consequences. Um, you know, and that might sound dramatic, but, you know, three years into my um uh, legal business I, I thought everything was a disaster you know one email that said get back to me quickly and I thought I'd done something wrong I'd lose all my business I was going to lose my house you know so, so this is what what stress and overwhelm can do to us because we lose perspective if we're not in if we don't have that sense of perspective then everything um, can feel too much and, and too um, we're too fearful because it is this sense of losing control. We just feel as though we're, we're out of control of what's going on around us. And I think for me, that's the real key sense because this feeling of overwhelm, the feeling doesn't come from what's actually in front of us. That's a fact, what's in front of us is how we feel about it that's creating the overwhelm. And it is because we feel that we're out of control. And that's why what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is about how we can take back some of that control how can we feel that we are more in control so what it's not about at this point in this session is is necessarily um you know doing less it's not that that is obviously one thing that you can do and you know we can look at that but this is about how we feel about things and how we can feel more in control 
um, another feeling that overwhelm sort of produces is that we struggle to delegate and we struggle to ask people to do things for us because we think it's better and quicker and easier to do them ourselves. And again, we catastrophic thinking. We, we're worried that it will go wrong if someone else does it. So we we need because we're feeling so out of control generally, we sort of get uh, we're micromanaging, if you like, and we're trying to hold on even tighter to what we're doing, which, of course, then just uh, sort of exacerbates the situation. Um, and we do we do become very unrealistic in respect of ourselves and what we're able to achieve because again loss of perspective so we're not able to step back and be kind to ourselves and we expect too much of ourselves so coping strategies i've already said if if you know if you're in an overwhelmed situation at the moment this will be great for you if not it's just something to have in your toolkit for if it comes up in the future um can start to feel panicky which I think is something Angela mentioned out of control and you know this idea of perspective is because our sensible and rational thing able to take that step back to see the bigger picture um, we're just very focused on what's right in front of us and um, you know unable to make rational decisions at that point so what we want to be able to do is to take some steps to be able to feel that we're in control again and that's what this is about today most of you um, know me very well already, so um, I won't, won't go into this too much, but I'm Hannah Becko, commercial property partner at Gunner Cook. Um, I've been there for nine years, so I have um, seen all the ups and downs of, I suppose, of, of creating this sort of legal business. And I still absolutely love it, although I know, you know, there are traps that we can fall into. Um, and, and that's what I love supporting people with now. Um, so aside of my uh, Gunner Cook business, um, I founded Authentically Speaking five and a bit years ago now I think which is about coaching and training lawyers to deal with things like yes stress management um, and it, it's grown into things like business development and all that sort of thing um, so my new exciting enterprise um, is the lawyers business mastermind that I started in March um, and that is very much to support self-employed lawyers because that is my um, absolute passion um, I'm also got three boys, so they are 11, 7 and 3. Um, so it is it is very, very busy in our household generally. So I know I know the struggles are real. Um, so eight steps to handling overwhelm. That's what I really want to share with you today. Don't need to worry about trying to write all these down or anything because I've got a handout that I can um, let you have at the end that's got it all on. So step one. This is very much a very simple process that you can follow. Step one is to stop because once we well, if we just carry on trying to keep running, we're only going to dig ourselves further into it. Keeping going isn't the best option at this stage. It's actually doing something about it. Um, so I know some of my clients have literally got my guide printed off and they keep it next to their desk. So when they feel these sorts of feelings coming back, they can they can just go to and follow this process. So the first thing to do is stop. And what I add to this, it, it's not on the slide, but I think it's on the handout, is, um, you know, when we stop, create some sort of break, create some sort of physical break here because this helps the brain. So we stop and then, so we realize that we're in this situation. We're looking at everything in front of us. We've realized we're overwhelmed because we can't decide what to do next. So we stop, get up and go and do something else. So go and make a cup of tea, make a cup of coffee, look out the window, do a couple of yoga stretches, do a few deep breaths. It doesn't need to be anything that takes a long time, but you need to do something that creates a break from that feeling of overwhelm to what you're going to go into now. So first stop. Second is to, to, to accept that it's OK. You know, we're not a failure here. We're not doing anything wrong. It's absolutely normal, especially with where we all are and the year that we've all had. It's absolutely normal to feel like this. We're not going to judge ourselves. We're not going to beat ourselves up. And, and I always like to say, you know, what would a kind friend say to you? If you were having a conversation with someone um, and they were telling you that they feel like you do, the sorts of things you would say is, well, of course, you're going to feel like this. Look at everything you've got on your plate. Look at everything that's going on. But we're often not that kind to ourselves. So this is just about taking a moment to be kind to ourselves. And that's where making the cup of tea or the cup of coffee or whatever comes in. You know, just do something for you just to break the pattern. 
Now, step three is to dump it all out. Um, now, I talk about this in, in lots of different ways, um, but literally for this exercise, you just want to write down everything that's on your mind, everything that you're seeing as a I must do. These can be big tasks, small tasks. They can be work related things. They might be home related things like order the shopping, pay the bill because they're all in your head. They're all in your head rolling around in there. Um, so write them all down as a list, every single thing, any decisions that need to be made, any conversations you need to have. Don't think about them. Don't try and evaluate them at this point and go, well, is that really important? Is it not? It's in your head. So put it down on the paper. Just put it all down. That's the, the next step. Now, step four is to start ditching them. So you've got everything down on your piece of paper. Then I want you to start crossing off anything that's not urgent for the next two or three days. Anything that will come up on its own, if it's needed, it will pop up. Someone will email you about it or someone will remind you about it. So you don't need to keep holding it in your head. Just cross that off the list. The next one is anything that, if you're honest with yourself, is never really going to get done. You know, and, and I know I had a client whose example of this was um, one of the lawyers in her team had qualified and she wanted to get her a congratulations card to say, you know, congratulations on qualifying. And it kept rolling around in her head. She kept saying to herself, I must buy that card. I must buy that card. And when I had this conversation with her, it turns out the girl had qualified four months before. And I was like, come on, it's four months. It's time to let it go. You're never going to buy that congratulations card. Wait till a year and send her an anniversary card instead. You know, you're never going to do that thing now. But when we are in either chronic stress or overwhelm, we stop being able to evaluate things. So they keep popping up for us. We keep thinking, oh, I really must write that article or I really must, um, whatever it is, tidy my inbox, whatever it is. And, and suddenly it becomes really important. And because we've lost perspective, we can't step back and realize that actually, you know, that thing is really not that important, but we've built it up in our heads. So anything that actually we can let go of, and if we're honest, we're never really gonna get time to do it then cross that off the list. And then the last one is anything that will naturally take care of itself in time. So you just don't need to keep carrying it, cross that off the list as well. Um, now the next one, one of my favorites, but again, very difficult for early stage self-employed lawyers to do is to delegate. So you know, we're not actually gonna delegate anything at this point. We're just looking at your list. We're not actually gonna start delegating here. But if you look at your list, what on there, what on the list could someone else do almost as well as you? They're not going to do it as well as you, but what could they do almost as well as you? You know, what would be good enough? Again, a difficult concept for lawyers, but what would be good enough? Um, would it take less time for us to find someone else to do it? Again, we're not finding anyone at this stage. We're just dealing with the list. So would it take less time if someone else could do it? If you assumed that everyone you asked said yes to you, what would you hand over? If you looked at those things on the list and everyone that you could possibly delegate to, if they were going to say yes, what would you hand over? And just make a note of that on your list. And then any other issues or concerns that having a conversation with somebody else might help with. So if there's anything on that list that actually raising it with someone else, having a chat through with them, would that help? Now, again, we're not going to have that chat at this point. We're just going to note it on the list that that is a possibility. Um, the next one is, is, is to take a little um, break point at this again and to refocus. So before we move on to the next step, again, we might just want to, you know, maybe it's time for another cup of tea. Maybe you look out the window, whatever you do. But then we want to try and refocus because that's what we've not been able to do when we're in overwhelm. We need to sort of think about the bigger picture because, again, we all get tunnel visioned. We talked about it with the sort of differences between men and women. But, you know, women, we have um, masculine traits as well. And one of them when we're stressed is to get extremely tunnel visioned. We lose the bigger picture that, that we normally have and we just get very tunnel visioned. So we need to take that step back and think, actually, you know, and for some people, um, might sound silly, but for some people in our position, it's actually, why did I even start this? Why, why am I self-employed? Why did I create this business for myself? What did I want? And if what I wanted was not to feel completely overwhelmed, then what is the bigger picture here? You know, what is important in your life right now? What really needs and deserves your attention? 
which can call for some tough decisions, you know, because sometimes we've said yes to, I don't know, yes, writing that um, article or co-writing a book or speaking on something or helping out with something else. You know, we've said yes to all these things when actually if the priority right now for you, for example, is growing and establishing your business, then maybe all those other things we need to start saying no to for now. So sometimes it does call for tough decisions. But again, at this point in the process, we're not making the decisions. We're just identifying, you know, what the options are. That's what we're doing. Um, so then we're coming to prioritize. So you've got your list. You've got everything on there. You've crossed through all the things that in, in the first point are never going to happen or they're not important enough to worry about now. So we just don't need to worry about them in the, at this point. Then we're going to go through whatever's left on our list and we're going to put next to it an A, a B or a C. So A absolutely has to happen today, has to. And be honest with yourself here, not just a, it would be nice because that's B. If it would be nice if it happened today, then you put a B next to it. If it could happen today, tomorrow or even the day after, then you put a C next to it. So you've got A, Bs and Cs then. And then you go and number them. So with all your A's, What's the most important thing? That's going to be A1. What's the next most important thing? That's A2, etc. So then what you've got is you've got a list and you've got the order that you need to do them in. So the reason that this is important is that when we are stuck in overwhelm and we can't decide between this thing or that thing, once we've done this exercise, we've got a list. We don't need to decide anymore. We just need to go to A1 and do it. And then when we've done A1, we need to go to A2 and do it, et cetera, et cetera. We just don't need to make decisions anymore. We can just go ahead and do them. Now, the last point I wanted to mention on this before I come and get, get your thoughts and questions and things like that is that all of this takes energy. You know, even making the decisions that we're making all day long, you know, the decisions like, is that clause in the lease a problem? Should I go back to this client now or do I need to do this client's work now? You know, all the things that we're making little decisions on take energy, even things. And I'm sure I'm not alone here. When someone says, do you want a tea or a coffee? And you can't decide. You literally have no energy to decide whether you want a tea or a coffee in that moment. Or someone says, what are we having for tea or what do you want for tea? And, and you just want it to appear in front of you because you've got no energy to make that decision you know and it is the same with work we're trying to we're making micro decisions all day long with with the work that we do so look after your energy what do you need to do and there's so many different ways to, to to look after ourselves but just at this point when we're in overwhelm or chronic stress it's the basic things that we have to remember because they're really really important and they do go out the window when we're overwhelmed and stressed so things like are you drinking some water in the day are you stopping to eat because again you know when people have been really busy this past year the easiest thing to do is to just keep working and not stop to eat but we do need energy if we don't stop to eat and refuel you know our bodies need fuel and the brain needs it if we don't stop and get some then we're actually not getting a lot done we're doing everything a lot slower and a lot more um, inefficiently than if we actually stopped and had a break and got something to eat sleep of course you know again this is another one lawyers are brilliant at this you know the one thing I'll forego is sleep I'm so busy I'm so overwhelmed who needs sleep I can catch up next week but again you know everything you're doing is probably taking three or four times longer if you're tired um, and also you're not doing it to your best ability you know you're not being as effective as inefficient and you know we're more likely to, to miss things perhaps as well so sometimes the best thing we can do is go and get an early night and start again the next morning so do remember that sleep is really important as well um, rather than something that we can just forego when we get busy and then the last one I've put there is anything else you need personally that helps you to feel like you so for me for example it's meditation I do my meditation every single morning if I don't do it then I know I'm going to have a harder day so that's my thing that I need for some people it's exercise it's going for a run it's being out in nature um, you know for some people it's walking their dog you know what is the thing that you need that helps you feel like you um, and how can you make sure that you're bringing that in as well? Um, because these are not just nice to have. These are what actually keep us going and help us to get out of that state of overwhelm much more quickly. And, you know, if we're really looking after ourselves then we might not get into that state of overwhelm at all. 
Um, so what I will do um, is send you a copy of my overwhelm guide. It's on my website, authenticallyspeaking.co.uk slash overwhelm, or you can also find it. I've rearranged all the website now. So if you go to four lawyers, there's a drop down menu and the overwhelm guide is in there. So you can have that um, to hand and you can just go to it whenever you need to, to follow those steps through again. So let me stop sharing. I can see we had a couple of comments come in while we were going, um, but yeah, let me know what, any questions, any comments, any of that resonate with you, throw it at us. Hi Hannah, I think um, I started laughing when you described getting that email and then thinking you were gonna lose your house as a result, only because I, I really recognize that I've been in that position where you've come back to a terse email from a, a client and, and all of a sudden it just has this big panic response. And I do wonder sometimes if it's because you you know, you've got so much else on, you're rushing everything, your immediate thought is I've messed up, I've done something wrong because I've not taken, or perhaps I feel like I haven't taken the time to do it. Or just that you, you have this sort of catastrophic chain of thinking, which is I've got to be, I certainly feel like this speaking for myself, I've got to be the best all the time, otherwise I'm going to lose my business. <laughs> And that's a problem and I do think it's um particularly when you're self-employed it's really hard to let go of that wanting to do everything perfectly or over over servicing the client I'm definitely guilty of that over servicing the client because you want to make them happy because it, their business is so important to you and that's really hard yeah yeah and I mean haven't you just hit the nail on the head there which is that as lawyers we are perfectionists anyway. That's one of our common character traits. And that's why the legal profession is generally so stressed out. But then you chuck in the fact that this is our business and we have to pay a mortgage every month. And it's amplified because anything that we do do wrong, you know, not that it would happen, you know, but in catastrophic thinking, when we've lost the sense of perspective and we can't step back and look at it rationally because of the stress reaction, the overwhelm feeling, then yeah. We, it, and that, that's exactly where I was five, six years ago. Literally, I would see the email or the phone call and my the, the pathways in my brain were already established, which is I've done something wrong. Therefore, I'll lose the client. I'll lose my business. I'll lose my house because my husband said when we bought this house, if you don't make X amount of money, we can't have this house. And that was literally what was going around in my head all the time. So, no, I... You're not alone. Um, and interestingly, I mean, I was just doing a session this morning for Manchester Young Solicitors Group. And even those young lawyers, they're getting the same thing. You know, they'll get a terse email from their boss and she was going into panic, like, oh my God, I've done something wrong. I'm going to lose my job. But it is a different level of stress for us, I think, because our job, you know, it's, it's our business. It's our livelihood. Um, and some people are the sole breadwinner or the main breadwinner as well. And, and I do wonder, uh, you did a session last year, which um, I couldn't make, but I, I, I was really interested in it, where as, as a profession, we are not primed to make mistakes. There is no room in our profession for us to make mistakes and for us to admit it. There's no general acknowledgement of the fact that it happens. All it is, is this idea, this threat that, well, you'll be sued, you'll lose the client, you'll lose your business. There isn't an awful lot of conversation that happens when you're training or you're a junior lawyer about, you know, we expect you'll make mistakes, don't worry. You know, you only have to look at the, the law reports that you see of solicitors who end up being, you know, struck off. And what they've done is they've covered up what was actually not a, not a massive mistake in the first place. And I think that is all about the culture we're in where mistakes, you're not supposed to make them. You know, you've got to get everything perfect. I've had people point out when I've made a very minor typo before in a you know, 300 page document or something, it's not acceptable. And um, and the conversations around it are always negative. It's always a threat. There's no sort of, you know, mistakes are gonna happen. It's always mistakes shouldn't happen if you're careful enough. And I think that's part of this yeah. worry that we all have. Yeah, no, it, it is a big problem. And to be honest, cause I work with some junior lawyers as well. It's something we talk about a lot. And in fact, I think some of the ladies have probably been on our sessions when we've talked about this. Um, you know, I've had lawyers who've been off sick for six months because the stress of the claim that they had to deal with and the way their firm dealt with it, et cetera, is just shocking. It's just, and it's wrong, it's wrong. Because do you know what? We are human. We are gonna get things wrong. I was gonna come to Tarek in a minute cause I thought he'd have a view on this. Um, we, um, we are gonna get things wrong. And, and we have to, I know that our, you know, we were trained differently, especially those of us who are more experienced. Sorry, everyone, but you know, we are, that's why we're here. Um, you know, 
all of our training and the way we came through was don't make a mistake, don't make a mistake. And again, that's the pathway. That's what our brain is saying. But we do need to change that because do you know what? I won't ask for a show of hands, but I think if I did, I would say how many people here have ever had to report a potential claim or a claim or go through that process? You know, and I would suspect it's going to be the majority of us, you know, and, and you know, Sarah Goldborn, I know, has always been um very supportive if anything has ever happened to anybody in the firm you know the view is in fact it was Sarah that said it to me some people say you're not a real lawyer until you've had to deal with a claim so mm -hmm. I think we can change our our belief system around this it's what we were brought up with as lawyers and baby lawyers and yes they should be dealt with differently it's not right and it's not fair but we just have to deal with where we are now but we have to change that thinking because we know it's not the end of the world it is what insurance is for you know, it is not the end of the world and it will be dealt with. And it is just recognising what you're talking about, Andrea, there and Andrea, Angela is a trigger. So for me, the email or the phone call was triggering the stress response. So what I had to do was unlearn that. And instead, now, if I see the email or the phone call that says get in touch with me urgently, it doesn't trigger a stress response. It just triggers what time is it? Have I got time to call them now? No, I haven't because I'm in a meeting. I'll call them later. Or yes, I've got time. I'll call them now. That's all it triggers because we have to just retrain our, our thinking. But you're right that it is a huge problem in the profession. It's still happening to junior people. And in fact, it's happening worse to junior people now because of all the recent decisions um, from the Solicitors Disciplinary Tribunal. Um, but we do have to change our thinking about it, definitely. Um, but yes, I was interested in what Tarek thought about it because Tarek and I have spoken about this actually. He said the black box thinking book is really good because where we are, all of us here, we're business people now. We're not just lawyers, we own businesses. And when you look at business as opposed to law, business people take risks. Lawyers are not very good at that usually. I'm not suggesting you take risks with negligence claims and getting things wrong for your clients, but we're so risk averse normally because we're lawyers, but now we're business people. And if you look at any businesses, they do take risks and that's how they grow. And, you know, um, I know Tarek and I have talked about this, um, the book, and I think Tarek, we were talking about, um, was it the medical profession and aviation as well? And if you read about those professions, they learn from their mistakes. They don't try and shove them under the carpet or be like, oh, it's career ending. It's like, no, this thing has happened. What can we learn from it? How do we change our processes? What do we do differently? It's a much more positive culture than we've traditionally had in law. But, you know, as I say, we're business people, so we should look to what businesses are doing, not what lawyers have traditionally done, if that makes there's sense. A, there's a pride element to it as well. <clears throat> Matthew Side in his book, Black Box Thinking, speaks a lot about the aviation industry and say, despite it being one of the most uh, potentially uh, riskiest sectors in the, in the planet, it's actually one of the safest because they are... Uh, you know, post-crash uh, analysis is very, very good. They ne they never apportion blame. They just look for what the issue was, learn from it very, very rapidly, and then disseminate the information very quickly. Lawyers, because of pride, whenever we, you know, come across some problem, uh, we never disseminate the information because we don't want to come across as, oh, I kind of cocked up there. And so, um, you know, don't want to show a sense of failure or sense of, uh, uh, you know, shortcoming. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the high performance podcast and they interview a lot of uh, successful people, mainly in sport, but also in business. And uh, the one common theme is um, failure is part of life. Uh, you cannot reach success in whatever measure you apply without going through failure. So you just have to embrace it. Now, you know, it's fine and good listening to it on a podcast and then practicing it in, in practice is very, very different for us. But I think we have to get comfortable with failure. You cannot get to success uh, without, you know, failure. And if we don't embrace it, it's going to be a very difficult life, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Tarek. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, um, for those of you that are parents, you know, when you're bringing up children these days, there is a different um, thinking, I think, around this idea of failure. You know, it's you know, we don't we don't say to them, oh, well, I can't believe you got that wrong. You know, how, how stupid of you or whatever. It's like, no, you tried, you know, and that's a good thing. And I know I, I don't know who it was, but there was an athlete who always shared that part of she thinks her reason for success is that when they got home from school every day, the dad would say to them what went wrong today. 
So it was not, oh, what did you achieve today? What did you do well today? It was like, so what went wrong today? You know, and it was it was um, a safety around things going wrong. But, you know, I'm, I'm like probably all of you, the generation, how I was parented, was coming home from school and saying, oh, dad, I got nine out of 10 in my maths test. And he was like, oh, that's great. What happened to the other one? Because he wanted me to achieve the very best I can. My dad's my biggest cheerleader. But that's the way we were parented. So we've still got to um, got, got to fight against that, if you like. And, and as lawyers, it does. I mean, that's why we ended up in law, because that's how we grew up. What happened to the other one? We're perfectionists. We always want to get it right. That's why we got hired in our first job. And that's why we make good lawyers. But it's no good for our mental health. So, okay. yeah. Hannah, can I just uh, uh, go back to something you said about um, pressure of losing your house? And I was just thinking about external pressures in that, you said that uh, your husband said, well, you're, you're coming at, you're cracking on with this venture. So really, if we lose our house, it's your fault. <laughs> you know, so, you know, um, I, I, you know, I'm being a bit flippant there, but there are those external pressures because, you know, I've made the decision to set up this business, my, my own practice and go self-employed, come out of a well-employed job where I had employee rights, all the rest of it. And uh, a well-paid job and I've, I've taken that chance and it, yes we did it as a team effort we you know we spoke about it. it wasn't just me taking that decision but in the back of my mind quite often I do have this right I'm doing this and I need to make this a, a success um, and it's that extra pressure maybe it, just, it probably isn't it isn't coming from my husband he's he's pretty chilled about it but it's coming from me and, um, and also on the failures point, if I could, um, why is it, Tarek, Hannah, why is it that lawyers put that extra pressure on themselves to say that we have to be correct, right all the time and we, and we shouldn't be making mistakes when we know all of us do, uh, lawyer, as lawyers are humans, why do we uh, put so much pressure on ourselves? You've got surgeons, got brain surgeons, got pilots, all the rest of it. I mean, they, if they make mistakes, they, they can be fatal, literally, whereas we're not making, hopefully, fatal uh, decisions. But we tend to put that extra pressure on ourselves. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of it, I think it's two things. One, it's our natural personality types, which we've just touched on. And also it is the way a lot of us were trained and the way that the profession has been, you know, and, and I think Kelly made a, a point, actually, I saw it pop up and I know Kelly's a litigator. For litigators, it might be even worse than us transactional lawyers because, you know, we're, we're about attention to detail. We're about notice. We're trained to notice issues. We're trained to look for the negatives all the time in our case, in our documents, um, you know, whatever it is. The way we're trained, unfortunately, lends itself towards us being more afraid of mistakes, of getting things wrong. Then, of course, you add in whatever your early experience was, you know, whatever firm you trained with in your early years. And as I say, I know some people who work for horrific places who literally been off sick with stress and had to leave, etc., because of the way issues were dealt with. Um, conversely, when I was training there was a partner in my firm a senior partner and he'd made a lot of mistakes he wasn't honest and open about it himself but I know he had at least two lawyers working most of the time just on his claims on his cases now I know we're not allowed to fix our own problems anymore now which I disagree with I think we should be able to but he could in those days and so I took actually a lot of comfort in that I was like do you know what he makes a lot of money he's very successful at the firm but he's made mistakes and so if it's okay for him to make mistakes and it's not career ending, then it can't be that bad. So I think it depends on what we've seen and our experiences with it as we've been training and, and you know, growing into lawyers. But again, it's, it is about, we can change, our brains are changing all the time. If you've not heard one of my, my presentations about stress, you know, brains aren't, they're not fixed. They change all the time. So we might have been running one program that said, cannot make a mistake. I'm going to lose everything if I do, et cetera. We can change that program to it not being the end of the world. Of course, we're going to try not to make, um, you know, client related mistakes. That's not to say, you know, th this is talking about one form of mistake. We're business owners. There might be other mistakes we make. We might invest in the wrong thing or we might try and delegate to a person who doesn't quite work out you know there are other mistakes we can make in business which we just have to make and then learn from 
and move on to the next thing. Um, what's another term for attention to detail? OCD, yeah, absolutely. The words we use affect us and define us. Sometimes we need to change what we tell ourselves, spot on, absolutely. You know, what we tell ourselves, we create. So if you find yourself running this sort of narrative that I was, which is I cannot possibly make a mistake or I'll lose everything, that's not fun. It's really not good. So we've got to sort of notice that we're having those thoughts and, and change that. You know, and it could be about taking risks with things like clients. So, you know, Paul gave us a great example earlier of the client who was on the phone before he got on this session. And now that's, you know, ramped up what he's got to do today. Maybe, and this is the beauty of being self-employed, maybe we get brave enough to say to some clients, do you know, no, I, I, I can't take that on now. I can't do that in that deadline. You know, I, I, could, I could do it next month or I could recommend someone else who could help you. Now that's scary for self-employed people because we want to hold on to all the work. We want to hold on to all the fees. We're worried about losing the house, etc. But one thing I can tell you I've learned over the last five or six years, once I took control of my business instead of it controlling me, is when I took more control of clients, I haven't lost one. Not that I know of. I haven't lost any clients by taking more control and saying no. Um, so, you know, th those are risks. They're not risks with our, you know, getting the work wrong or claims or anything, but they're risks within business. And, and we can get better at taking those, I think, sometimes. I don't know what anybody else thinks about that. But, um, oh, fantastic discussion today, guys. We could talk about this for ages. Um, we've all taken the risk to get our businesses up and running. So perhaps we shouldn't think of ourselves as risk averse at all. Absolutely spot on. I mean, how many lawyers would go into business? Not many. <laughs> Not many lawyers would go into business. Um, well, in the old days, there are many of us around now who um, who, who go into business. And uh, one, of, one of my coaches said um, he, he likes me because I'm like I'm a entrepreneur who thinks like a lawyer rather than or, or something but that was quite nice that was a nice piece of um of feedback and there's no reason we shouldn't be we must get out of the box that we were put in or we put ourselves in years ago and um you know we're not risk averse definitely i love that i really like that oh it was lovely to see you all today could stay here and chat with you all all day Oops. thanks hannah that, thanks for your time it's really useful Thanks, Hannah. Yeah, thank you, I might put a bet on the horses tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Don't no. make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to yeah. tell my next client to go away on the one they phone me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's sunny today, Angela, so you can enjoy the sun. Tomorrow's forecast is biblical. <laughs> uh, well, it's not that sunny here, but yeah, we've got oh, the dear. same biblical forecast, I think, for tomorrow. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's not been fun, has it? Well, there you go. If you want to challenge everybody, say no to a client. There's your challenge. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Anna. Thank you so Thanks much, Hannah. Thanks, Hannah. Bye. 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 Bye.